today as we come to the table. Daniel got put over all the wise men, or we would say magi, of the east. We three kings of Orient are, which it was probably way many more than three kings. Don't get into all that right now. But the bottom line is, is that the Magi, they were the ones that came in search of the promised Messiah because they saw prophecy fulfilled. Where did they learn it? They didn't have Bibles in that part of the country. They weren't Hebrews. They weren't, where did they learn? This is so interesting to me because it would appear that Daniel, being over all the Magi in that region, taught them the Word of God, taught them prophecy. It passed on down through Medo-Persia, down into Alexander the Great as these survived and passed it on and on. If you grew up in a Christian family, can you trace back through the generations when your family members first got saved? Was it through your grandparents or even your great-grandparents? Does it go back further? God's faithfulness and blessings are passed down through the generations. Isn't that so amazing? Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Today, Pastor Mark teaches that Daniel was promoted to be the leader of all the wise men, or Magi. It was most likely Daniel's influence and teachings that led the Magi to search for Jesus in Bethlehem hundreds of years later. You never know how your faithfulness and obedience to God today will affect future generations. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Daniel chapter two with today's edition of Come to the Table. Kanye West, whether you know about him or know his music, and I don't really know much about him or his music, but you see him in the news. Some of you that are younger certainly know, but again, a very famous billionaire rapper, if you will. Um, some of his digital people got upset with him recently, and they literally shut his account down. He was talking about it last week. He said, I couldn't use my Apple Pay to go buy anything. He said, I literally said, I'm a billionaire, and I couldn't buy anything. And then he made a statement. He said, if they'll do this to a billionaire, don't think they won't do it to you. Now, how much he knows and doesn't know, I don't know. But he made the point so clearly, there's going to be such control when this takes place that you can't literally buy or sell unless you do this. Now, the formulation for the mark, but not the mark. So people ask me, well, what is the mark? You know, was this the mark? Was that the mark, et cetera? Was the shot the mark? No, I don't believe so. Whether you stand on any of the, wherever you're on these issues, and I know there's different viewpoints in here. The point is, the Bible specifically tells us what the mark will be and who will implement it. And so here's what I want you to know. The mark will be implemented by a man based out of Europe. It'll be a man that says, you've got to do this. And it'll be a mark that's on your hand or your forehead. But Elon Musk is already doing the things in the brain. People are already taking chips in the hand. That's true, but that is not yet the mark. These are the headwinds of the storm that's coming. All the technologies in place, some people are already involved in it. But it's going to be where the Antichrist is going to say, now, you have to do it. You have no choice. You have to do it or you can't buy and sell. Now, here's the thing. Is that going to happen before the rapture of the church? I do not believe so. And I'll tell you why. Again, I don't say this just to encourage you. I say this because here's the bottom line. You look throughout history. There's, there's three kinds of wrath the Bible talks about. There's God's wrath, man's wrath, and Satan's wrath. The church has always gone through Satan's wrath and man's wrath. And you know what? We may go through some of that as well. There's no guarantee that this church and this generation is going to avoid man's wrath or is going to avoid Satan's wrath. But there's something that's consistent from the very beginning of the Bible all the way through, and that is never have the righteous been subjected to God's wrath. Go back to the ark. What happened? There were only eight righteous on the earth, sadly, but he took all the righteous off of the earth. He kept them off of the earth until the judgment was done, interestingly enough. And then when the judgment was over, he brought them back down to the earth. That's a beautiful picture of the rapture of the church. Exactly what's going to happen. Now go to Sodom and Gomorrah, the same thing. He said, I can't do anything with God's wrath, the angel said, while you're here. They literally yanked them out of there. They yanked them. They literally grabbed them and raptured them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. I had to pull them out because they didn't want to leave. 
and then God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, but God spared the righteous before he did that. We know in 70 AD that the righteous, the believers, were removed from Rome, rather removed from Jerusalem before the armies came in to wipe out everybody that was in there because of persecution. But God removed them. And so then, God, then the judgment came, and they were already taken out of the way. And the same thing, I believe, is going to happen when we see the rapture of the church. God's going to grab his people and take us out of here. But the, we don't know when that's going to happen in this process. But the key is, now that we see the revived Roman Empire formulating very quickly, it's going to be soon. And we need to be ready. And so, again, um, when you see this taking place, again, this foreshadowing happened. Realize this is something that God predicted. It's something that God said was going to happen, and it's something we're expecting to happen. Now, let me make an appeal to some of you in here today who don't know the Lord, because there are probably some of you that don't. And, and I want to say this with all seriousness of heart and let you know there's, there's a way you can avoid that. But there is the potential that some of you hearing this message right now will miss the rapture of the church. Now, why do I say that? Because... You may be a person that's come to church your whole life. You may be somebody that's coming because of religion. You may have been invited by a friend, but you've never given your life to the Lord. You may be that person that says, I'm going to wait till I see whether or not it really happens, and then I'll make a decision. Here's the problem. The Bible says if you wait until to make the decision after the church disappears, it's going to be right after that that this world leader of Europe is going to make everyone with the new digital currency and all the digital things, you're going to have to take the mark of the beast to survive, Okay. And for those of you that, again, I know, I understand that, you know, we'll prepare, you know, we'll be ready or whatever. Well, again, the point is, is that most people aren't going to be doing that kind of thing. And we don't know what this atmosphere is going to be like. So the reality is, if you find that happening and suddenly you're left behind, you're either going to have to take that mark or the Bible says the Antichrist will put people to death. And you go, how could that happen? That seems so, uh, the big popular word today, draconian or so, whatever, this kind of thing. The bottom line is, that's what the Bible says is going to happen. And it appears that his method will be primarily beheading, kind of gross, but at least God's mercy in this sense. For those who get saved after the rapture, that is a very quick way to go, a very quick and painless way to go. There'd be a moment of fear in advance, and then suddenly the lights go out. That's probably about one of the easiest ways to go, although that's a horrid thought, okay? Here's what I'm saying. If you're one of those that waits to see if it's really going to happen, and suddenly we're really gone, don't take the mark. Do not take the mark. The Bible says if you take the mark, your soul is eternally condemned and there's no more hope. Those who take the mark will be, if you will, cast into the eternal lake of fire. And so it's better to go to your death than it is to take the mark of the beast. I know that's a serious discussion, but it's something I feel that we need to contemplate, especially if you're here today and you don't know the Lord. Now, don't worry. that There's going to be more good news before we're done. And so no need to panic. But notice this, this kingdom here. Look at verse 42. It says, And as the toes and the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix or adhere uh, with the clay. Now, this is interesting because you look at the feet and it's got the toes made partly of clay, partly of iron. What it's saying is, is that the whole world is going to be forced into this by iron strength. The whole world will be forced into this mold, but there's going to some, be some people and maybe even countries involved in it that really don't want to be there. That's going to be the clay. For example, let's say today suddenly the world's taken over and America has to be a part of this new European government with this world leader. And our governmental leaders say, okay, we'll be a part of it because we have to. We're being forced into this mold. But there'll be a lot of Americans who'll say, I don't want to be a part of this. That's the clay. So not everybody's going to be in 100%. But the iron is too strong for anybody to resist, so everybody's going to be forced into this mold. Again, I think we've already seen a foreshadowing of this. Maybe you heard about Britain trying to pull out of the European Union a couple of years ago. They called it Brexit, and that is Britain and Exit put together Brexit. They voted to leave the European Union. That's what they voted to do. And you know what? The, they still have not done it. In other words, the government said, okay, you voted to do it, but we just are not going to do it. Guys, that's iron and clay being forced together. You're watching the toes and the feet. Regardless of what the people want, they're being forced into the mold they have to be involved in because of the spirit of the age. It would be like this. It would be like suddenly the, the governor's election comes up and we all go vote for a governor or whatever. The governor wins the election and all of a sudden the leaders go, okay, he won, but we're just not going to put him there. Okay? We'd be going, what are you talking about? Well, he won, but we're not going to put him there. That's the picture it's giving here. There's going to be those who don't like this, but they're going to be involved in it. They're going to be pulled into it, and they're going to be a part of this whole thing. It's going to be iron mixed with the feet of clay. 
And again, this is why it's not going to be adhered together well. That's why it, toward the end it says that the Antichrist will break, or rather some of those nations will break off from the Antichrist and actually turn on him at the very end. That's that clay part when it's broken, it's fragile. And when he pushes them too far, some of them are going to break away. And again, this is why he's different than Nebuchadnezzar. You couldn't break away, but even though he's going to have more strength, if you will, in his brutality than Nebuchadnezzar. And so notice this. It says this is going to happen, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, this final revived Roman Empire that has already begun, I believe, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now we're talking about the return of the Lord. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Isn't that great? It's not just going to be for a thousand years uh, when the Lord comes back. It's going to go on right into the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever and ever. He says, insomuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Now, several things to point out here. Notice, first of all, he refers to the stone cut out without hands. All throughout Scripture, we see Jesus is called our rock. Now we see this rock or stone cut out without hands, representing Jesus, our rock, being uncreated and returning to totally destroy all the other kingdoms. So it's like uh, he was non-created, God in human form. He's going to come back and strike this image at its feet, by the way, which destroys the image from the bottom up. So complete collapse. By the way, we'll see later in Daniel that all of these kingdoms are still intermingled in the kingdoms of the world today. And if you go back and look at Babylon and you look at Medo-Persia and you look at Alexander the Great in Rome, we have a little bit of all of them in our culture today. Now, if you don't know their history, you don't know that. But all of these kingdoms are still intermingled. But the greatest part is the Roman part. And that's the part that's going to be revived. But the Lord will come back. He'll strike this at its feet. Um, and so the image is destroyed. Interestingly enough, this time in reverse. Remember the first time at the very beginning of the vision, Daniel's talking about what's going to be happening in the future. Now Daniel gets to the end of the vision and talks about in reverse. And rather than gold working down to iron, it now gets destroyed from iron up to the gold and showing a complete destruction of all these kingdoms. And I love the way that he finishes this, the finality and the surety of this. Daniel said, the dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. And that's always the way it is with the word of God. The dreams are always certain. The interpretation is always sure. And so we have that confidence in uh, what's going to happen in the future. Now notice this. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. I mean, I'll bet. We just think about this. Prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. Now, you, you can only imagine how Nebuchadnezzar must have felt at this point. Um, I don't believe he fully remembered the dream himself until Daniel reminded him. And he not only told him the dream, he gave him the undeniable interpretation of it. Uh, Dan, you know, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't one to bow to anyone, but he bows down to Daniel, this righteous man, and says, you know what? Uh, not only that, bring him an offering. And bring incense and burn it to him. Now, it doesn't tell us what Daniel did, but I can assure you Daniel didn't receive that. Daniel would have said, no way. I'm not having that. That's only for God. And so he doesn't give us the details there. But no doubt uh, Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have had a problem with that after what Daniel had just done. And it says, the king answered Daniel and said to him, truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. Isn't that great? Now he already sees the truth. This unbeliever declaring, yes, that God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. And then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Now, that's interesting to me. Note that. Daniel got put over all the wise men, or we would say magi, of the east. We three kings of Orion are, which it was probably way many more than three kings. We won't get into all that right now. But the bottom line is, is that the Magi, they were the ones that came in search of the promised Messiah because they saw prophecy fulfilled. Where did they learn it? They didn't have Bibles in that part of the country. They weren't Hebrews. They weren't, where did they learn? This is so interesting to me because it would appear that Daniel, being over all the Magi in that region, taught them the word of God, taught them prophecy. It passed on down through Medo-Persia, down into Alexander the Great as these survived and passed it on and on, all the way down to the Roman kingdom. And no doubt, Daniel is the reason when they saw the star rising there from the east that they headed and found the Messiah as what we're celebrating here at Christmas time. And so you look at the influence that Daniel had. You never know what you're going to share, what you're going to teach the impact that's going to have later on, but that's probably where the history here from how they even knew about what to look for came. And also Daniel petitioned the king 
And he sent Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. That is, others ruled and reigned with him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had important positions. But notice this, Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Why is that important? Because that's where all the most important people of the kingdom sat. The king sat there, and his greatest court officials sat there as well. So it shows you how highly that Daniel was elevated. Now, again, this is some heavy stuff. And we say this very frankly and very straightforwardly. Listen, especially if you don't know the Lord, this can be fearful. This can be shocking. But guys, this is one of the most exciting times in world history to be alive. Listen, we don't have to be afraid. As I said, the evidence scripturally convinces me that we will not be here when the worst of this comes, although we may go into a portion of it. And here's why I get really excited about this. Not the death, not the destruction, not of the, nobody's excited about that. But here's the reality. How many of us want to see God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, which we pray every time we pray that prayer? The only way that can happen is to travel through this period known as the, the last day scenario, the revived Roman Empire, the revealing of the Antichrist, and moving through that to get to the other side. God has chosen us, I believe, to be a part of that generation. And so, again, it's a great privilege, and we know what's going to happen. We know that God's going to give us grace. Well, what's going to happen? What if they do go digital and they cut my food off? Listen, here's what the Lord said. Here's a promise to you as believers. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added. And when you read the things before, he's talking about food, clothing, housing. Yes, if everything gets shut down for whatever reason, if all these things, we talk about that, which I don't think will happen until the Antichrist is in full power. But even if something was to happen in some strange way prior to that, if you're seeking the kingdom of God first, he is bound to his word. And you will have food, and you will have a place to live, and you will be taken care of. And you know what? If God ever has us go through something where we enter the kingdom through some other means of martyrdom, such as others have done, God will give us the grace to do that. That is, the, that is the power of our God. And again, all of these things may not seem so much like a privilege right now, but in the kingdom of God, they're going to be a great privilege. And there's great hope and there's great promise for us. How much of the world right now has no idea what's going on? And yet you know. How much of the church today has no idea what's going on? And yet you know. I was reminded again just this past week, someone said, you know, um, uh, there's so many people, different pastors, and I heard it again, somebody came to me this morning, they said, we're never going to teach prophecy, we'll never go through that, we're not going to do that or whatever. Do you realize that prophecy is a third of the Bible? That means if they're not going to teach prophecy, there's this much of the Bible they're leaving out. That much of the Bible, the churches, many churches are saying, we won't teach that. I don't know about you guys, but in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. This is the Word. How much of Jesus can you do without in the days in which we live? A third without Jesus? I want every drop. And, and listen, if there was ever a time that the church needed prophecy, it is today. I believe part of the reason for prophecy, it's for the whole Bible, I get that. But one of the main reasons I'm convinced was for specifically the last days because the Lord said, my kiddos are going to be seeing some really wacko stuff going on. I don't want them to be afraid. So I'm going to tell them what's going to happen. I'm going to show them I'm in control. I'm going to show them there's a timetable. I'm going to let them know that I'm going to deliver them out of that before the time comes. And I'm going to make sure that they're with me in the kingdom of God. I love the whole picture we see in the wedding supper of the Lamb. Again, we see uh, the picture of the, the, the marriage, if you will, the ceremony of, of the, the bride. The bride was taken and spent seven days there celebrating uh, before they came back and were presented to the city. I believe it's a picture of the, earth, of the church being taken seven years to feast with the Lord in heaven at the wedding supper of the Lamb, as it talks about at the end of Revelation, and then coming back to the earth where Jesus will present himself and his bride to the entire world where we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ for the thousand years and then forever beyond that. Now, why do I say all this? I want to make sure that I encourage you guys after such a heavy message. <laughs> and I want you to realize this is not a time to be afraid. Guys, this is not a time to be afraid. And for those of you that are thinking, well, I'll just hide. I'll just kind of pull away. Nobody will find me when all this stuff happens. What has Jesus called you to do? To run and hide? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus said, I've done nothing in a corner. I'm not talking about not being prepared. That's called wisdom. Preparation is wisdom, but there should never be a time that we as believers pull away to get away from the world because things are getting bad. No, as a matter of fact, that's when we jump right in the middle of it and say, here's why it's getting bad, and here's the hope that all of you have. And we're his mouthpiece. We're his messengers. We're the ones that are giving that, that message. And so, again, as we finish today, 
It's interesting to me as I was looking at this and thinking about it, because you think about prophecy in the future, and that's kind of fun to see as far as that goes and all. But there's something that really stuck out to me in this particular time of going through this passage, and that is how hard and vicious and dictatorial this final kingdom is going to be, um, you know, and, and then how we're to react to that. Because note this, this is a true mark of the enemy. Whenever choice is removed, it's a true mark of the enemy. Whenever God's involved, you have a choice. When the enemy's involved, he pulls all choice away. You will do what I say or die. You're forced to do it. And God says, no, you know, come unto me if you will. If, I'm here for you. Listen to this one. It says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, God said this, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Again, Joshua 24, 15, Joshua said, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, I think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he said, Hey, what do I need to do to follow you? And he said, You got to make a choice. Your, your, your money is your God, so choose to leave your money and follow me, or you're going to have to reject me and, and choose your money. Sadly, he walked away choosing his money. But again, the Lord gave him that choice. Then with the disciples, and this one is always interesting to me, the Lord was teaching a hard message, maybe not unlike what we're hearing today, but except we know what it was. It was eat my flesh and drink my blood. He was talking about the Passover lamb and all that and using it symbolically, but the people didn't understand it. Imagine the setting in a church today, and the preacher begins to preach that, the pastor begins to say that, and suddenly a big bunch of the people get up and walk out like, this guy's crazy, we're getting out of here, you know, we're gone or whatever. And as the Lord watches them leave, he allows them to leave, but he turns to his disciples and he says, how about you? Are you going to choose to leave or are you going to choose to stay? And Peter very wisely said, Lord, you know, where would we go? You hold the words of life. In other words, this is hard stuff to hear, but you're the one that holds the words of life. You're where, you are where hope is, and so we're staying right here. So way to go, Peter. Great answer. The question is, as we finish today, is what will your choice be about your eternal destiny? Again, remember, Satan doesn't give a choice. You will take the mark or you will die. You will do what I say or you will not buy food. You will not buy gas. You, you will, you will, you will. You will wear the mask. You will get the shot. You will have a lockdown. Again, I'm not judging those. I'm saying the spirit of that force we're starting to experience, it's only going to get stronger. And so we've got to make up our mind before that comes where we're going to stand as believers. But my challenge to you today, if you're an unbeliever or someone who's never given your life to the Lord, what is your choice going to be? The Lord's offering you today a choice of life or a choice of death. Will you choose life? And the message is simply this. It's not hard, but we have to lay our pride down. You've got to say to the Lord, okay, I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. But I believe you died for me on the cross. Your blood washes my sin away. I believe you rose three days later. And because of that, I can rise and be alive forever. And Lord, I choose to turn away from my sin and follow you. And so that's the choice we have this morning. That's what God is laying before each of us this morning. The question is, what will your choice be? Some of you have made that choice already. Some of you have not made that choice. And so I want to give you an opportunity to make that choice right now. And so let's pray and ask God to do that. Father, again today, heavy message in many ways. And yet a very exciting message in other ways. Because God, we see that you're in control. You have all power, all authority. And Lord, you've told us what's going to happen in advance. And you promised us, Lord, that you would deliver us. God, we see all throughout your word, you deliver the righteous before your wrath is poured out. That is a precious promise. And that is why your word calls the rapture of the church the blessed hope. The world doesn't have a blessed hope. They only have doom and gloom. But you, Lord, offer us a blessed hope. Thanks for joining us today on Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. Pastor Mark is teaching a series from the book of Daniel where we see how to be faithful to God in the midst of consequences that were brought on a sinful nation. The Israelites were forced to live in Babylon, a foreign nation far from their homeland. Can you imagine being a young man as Daniel was, living in a strikingly different religious society than what he believed? How hard would it be to stand firm in your faith? To me, it sounds pretty similar to what we experience when we make a stance for Christ. Although we may not be living in a foreign land, we still come across opposition to our faith. But as we learn from Daniel's life, God gives us courage to not bow down to the idols of this world. We can overcome great obstacles through the power of the Holy Spirit and trusting He is with us. 
We hope as you've listened today, you've been encouraged to stay true to Jesus where you live and work. We'd also like to invite you to come visit us. If you're in the Knoxville area, why don't you come to Calvary Knoxville this weekend? Find our service times by going to thewaymedia.net and then click on the Calvary Knoxville tab. Scroll to the bottom and click on the Outreach of Calvary Knoxville link. Once you determine which service works for you, bring the whole family. If you want to listen to any of these studies again, just click on the Come to the Table link online at thewaymedia.net or connect with the Way Media app. We look forward to connecting with you in any of these capacities. We'll continue our verse-by-verse study through Daniel next time on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.